Okay. Um, so get ready because uh, I, I'm hoping over the next 50 minutes that you're, you're going to do a little self-reflection about you and your career. Um, you look fine. Okay. But that's what this career hacking is about. So the question I asked earlier was how many of you are building a product? And if I recall about 75% of you said yes. Okay. But my answer is that it's all of you because to my mind, each of us is the product. So we're a hundred percent of us are engaged in building a product and that product is you. Um, and so this gives you some insight into how I think about career hacking. We are all products, and I just want you to be thinking about how to, how to package and position yourself. These are all cereal boxes on a shelf, and I wanna give you some tools how to think about what it takes to be the cereal boxes that, have, that are sold out, the, the, the boxes that everybody wants. Um, so I just want you to start with that thought if, that you are the product. And this career of, uh, uh, this idea of hacking your career, we're all, in, in building product, we're used to having a hypothesis, and then we find ways to experiment what works or doesn't. And then we have results and feedback system. I have been thinking about my own career and everyone's career in the same way. You have hypotheses about what, what you wanna do with your career. You have ways to experiment those ideas. And then you have results and feedback systems. And that's the, the overall concept of what happens with this career hacking. Marcus introduced me already. Uh, the key thing is I was at Netflix starting in 2005, and then in 2010, I went on to Check, which is now a public company focused on textbook rental, saving students a billion dollars. Um, and then I, my, my structure today, there's really three chapters. So the first is I'm gonna talk about how to position yourself. What are the skills and how do you develop those skills as your career progress? The second is how do you take an experimental approach to, to hacking? and doing it via a variety of side projects. And then third is that results and feedback system, which I call your personal board of directors. Now, I, I am gonna be, you're gonna learn too much about me. I don't want you to take me too seriously. When my daughter first saw this photo, she instantly tweeted this photo, which is just a nice reminder to, to me. Uh, and the other thing, this is my family. Uh, it's Kristen on the left, Kelsey Britt, and then me, I'm the awkward 58 year old white dude. And this is me, you know, acknowledging my privilege, my luck. I'm hoping that everybody can, can, can have the false confidence that I, I really didn't deserve. Um, but, but I will be sharing things through my lens and I recognize that everyone else, everybody's life is different. All right, so that first chapter, what I want you thinking about is how do you position yourself? And I just want to share with you just one simple positioning model that, that I've used in positioning products, but I also use it to position myself. So the, the first question I ask in this positioning model is, what is it? And I, I look for a very brief description of what it is. What are the benefits? Because at the end of the day, people are not buying things. They're, they're, they're buying help solving their problems, the benefits. And then there's this odd uh, concept of, of personality. In positioning, you're trying to create a relationship with, with your customer, and you, it's helpful to, to have some clue about the personality. Um, so for instance, in, in Netflix, the way that we positioned it, Netflix is a TV movie subscription service. In really simple terms, that's what it is. It's fast, it's easy, it's entertaining, and it's a great value. And then we hoped that you saw the personality that, as though it's delivered in a straightforward and friendly way. Uh, our hope and our intent was that's how you would see Netflix as a product. So if I take this positioning model and apply it to myself, this is how I position myself. I don't say this, I wouldn't say this in an interview, but this was my thinking behind. Gibson Biddle is a product leader executive who helps start up with a proof of concept to scale through strong strategic thinking, management, and leadership skills. And then I reveal my personality in a genuine, quirky way. I'm, I, I know this. I, I, I own it. I'm just a little bit odd. So this is how I position myself today because I, I think of myself as a product. So the, the thing that I want you thinking about is how might you position yourself? And I want you to have a little texture on how you might think about the skills and benefits of product leaders. For me, product leaders, it could be in technology, it could be design, you could be in marketing, you could be in data science. You know, anybody who's, who's building a, a product. So I want you thinking now, or what are the skills of a product leader? I, I brought up a totemic, an archetypal 
uh, a leader and Steve Jobs. And just think for a moment about what are his skills. And this is where I'm gonna use Slido. Um, and just what are the key skills of a product leader? And that's the question I have of you now. You know, bonus points if you can put in single words because we'll build a word cloud. And you can actually put in multiple answers. And if you haven't set up Slido, Slido yet, just hold up your phone to the QR code as though you're taking a picture and, an, and a link will magically pop up. And then you can answer my questions. What are you seeing, Marcus? What are you seeing? I mean, vision, definitely leadership strategy. Um, I guess the listener here, uh, collaborative, perseverance, communications, so responsive, close to the market, so the pulse from the customers. And uh, sales, so being a salesperson to sell yep. the product. Yeah, and, and I can tell they're also thinking about um, Steve Jobs. So sometimes I see turtleneck, <laughs> and sometimes I say see bad words, or sometimes it's the uh, what do they call it, the distortion field. Um, anyways, you know that he could talk you into things. Communication, that's that's a big one, uh, and I I tend to put that in in a broader word called management, and I see some storytelling as well. All right, uh, so I see big on communication, big on strategy, big on vision. Oh, I love the authentic one, uh, which is at the end of the day, you know, as leaders, that's one of the biggest challenges to, to be a leader, but to do it in an authentic ma manner. Uh, this is super helpful for me. I've been asking this question a lot. And really what we're trying to get to is how, what are the skills of a product leader? And the way I think about it is I divide the, the skills into two halves. There's product skills. So you're, you're engaged in building a product. And then I have leadership skills. And actually, the leadership skills that I'm going to outline are the same for a head of product or a head of finance or a head of marketing. And just so you know, I, I expect people, even at the beginning of their career, to, be, to begin to think about how they can grow as a leader. So, you know, to my mind, if it's your first day of work and your first job, I want you to be thinking about how do you develop leadership skills. So I'm gonna just share with you, um, if, if I were interviewing a product manager, I've interviewed like 500 product managers, I'll just put on the whiteboard these seven words and I'll ask a candidate to tell me which skill is the strongest and which is the weakest. And the natural question they all ask is what do you mean by each of these world, words? So I will share with you. M my definition of technical is you work effectively with engineers. Uh, and you'll learn, I'm, I'm, I'm light technically, but I never let my eyes gloss over working with engineers. Management, yes, there's a lot of communication in that, but I think about it as light process to deliver results. And then creativity is the lifeblood of what we do. You generate ideas that matter. And then at the end of the day, you're trying to develop a business, deliver shareholder value, profit, so you can invest to make an even better product in the future. And then marketing, to know me, I actually was, my first career was in marketing. But you have to have the skills to package and position ideas in ways that make them relevant to your customers. And then design, design got harder like in the last 10 years as we all had to figure out how to work on these tiny little devices. You work well with designers and you value simplicity. And then I call the last thing consumer science. Sometimes people bring up empathy. I saw that word in the first thing. For me, it's you develop consumer insight via qualitative focus groups, usability through surveys, I'll do an NPS survey at the end, through the existing data, and then the big dog is A-B testing. So you, you do two versions and you see which one changes customer behavior. So these are the skills that I look for, the product skills. So I want you thinking about the same question. If, if Gib interviewed me, you know, what are my top two or three skills? And I tend to encourage people to focus on their top skills, their superpowers, and not worry so much about the weaker skills. All right, so now I go to the other side of the equation. Um, it doesn't matter what function you are, um, whether in product or marketing or CFO, these are the skills that I look for, or in a CEO. So a same exercise, seven words, and I will define what I mean by each. So my definition of leadership is, is your ability to communicate an inspired, uh, inspired communication of a, of a vision. And management is different here. At some point, you're actually hiring, firing, and developing teams. It's different from the work of building a product. And then I saw strategy in my very specific definition, uh, your ability to form hypotheses about how you will delight customers in hard to copy, 
margin enhancing ways, finding the, the overlap of those three ideas. And that's how I think about strategic thinking. Leaders lead. So you, you can't be a follower, and that means you have to be proactive, do what it takes, uh, and because people will follow you. And then there's a lot of very wonderfully uh, entrepreneurial CEOs that do whatever it takes to, to get the money. Um, but there's a softer issue that I balance with that, and that's culture. And culture, you know, one hand, it helps evaluate whether you're a good fit with a company, but the more important thing for you as a leader is this creates a foundation for light process. If the culture and the values are well understood by every employee in the building, people can make great decisions without talking to each other. And you know, the reason I keep focusing on light process is highly talented, highly creative people don't like being told what to do and they don't like being told how to do it. And process squeezes the, the life out of truly innovative stuff. And this is where culture is really marvelous for helping deliver great decisions without process. Business maturity, it's kind of a bummer to me. It's not quite as correlated as with age as I would have expected, but this is you have great judgment around people, around product, and the business. Uh, and, and that's what is wicked important as a leader. And the last, I'm just acknowledging that, that if you were looking for a candidate for a specific job, sometimes you need a specific domain expertise. So my expertise from, from a stage point of view is I look for startups with a proof of concept that are ready to scale and then I'm helping them to grow. And I'm not the right person for a big company and I'm actually not a starter. I, I don't like starting stuff from scratch. And I love both education and, and um, entertainment. So that's my domain expertise. All right, um, this is, I, I, I expect that almost all of you use Slack. This is April Underwood. Uh, she was the product leader at Slack until about a year ago. You know, I asked her, hey, um, April, how do you evaluate your, your product skills? And she said, hey, I grew up as an engineer. I'm strong technically. Uh, I really care about the business and I actually have surprisingly good marketing skills. So this is her self-evaluation. And the thing to recognize is everyone's different. And there's no right answer. Uh, you know, each role, each company will, will, if they're smart, they'll figure out which of these skills they're looking for. Um, but there's no one right answer for, for being a product leader at different jobs. So I asked her the same question. What are your, you know, superpowers on the, on the right side, the leadership skill? I'm really good at strategy and I'm intensely proactive and results oriented. And I think I have good judgment around people, product, and the business. So if you want to understand me, you know, and this is some of the insight about how I packaged and positioned myself. I'm very strong on business, on marketing. Early in my career as a marketing guy, and I'm way into this consumer science, the developing consumer insight through uh, focus groups, surveys, the existing data, and A-B testing. And then the leadership skills, um, I've been very focused the last 10 or 15 years on my leadership skills, on the management of building organizations, and then strategy. So this is me. And the, the obvious thing I want you thinking about is what are your superpowers? On each side of the ledger here, the product or the leadership skills, what are your top two or three superpowers? And this is the list. And so now I'm gonna use Slido to learn a lot about you. Um, so this is the first, the left-hand list, if you will. What are your top two to three product skills? Um, and if you're just joining us, Marcus, can you reiterate how to use Slido? Sure. So use your um, mobile phone camera and snap the, the QR code that you see there or go to slido.com and enter the code CRISP. We've also pasted the link in the chat. Awesome. Awesome sauce. All right. So, um, yeah, I, I let you choose two or three. It's up to you. You know, if, if you were interviewing with me and I put these seven skills on the whiteboard and I asked you to highlight your top two or three skills, what would they be? Are you seeing anything surprising here, Marcus? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of people with technical skills, uh, but also on the business side and consumer science. Yeah, and then you see how freakish I am as somebody who you know started in marketing and then switched over to product, right? Um, and now I'll just reinforce here, there's no right or wrong answer. What I really like people do is just to be honest about who they are and their skills. Um, and, and, and that usually is, is rewarded and recognize that, that, that what's needed at each company is always a little bit different. All right, so then I'm gonna flop over to the other side of the list. So what are your top two or three leadership skills? So seven skills are on a whiteboard uh, and I just wanna know which of these skills you, you, you have the strongest in.
I'm nicely waiting to get some more data for you, Marcus. Um, okay, what do you, any surprises here, Marcus? Um, interesting that not a lot of people answer domain expertise and uh, a lot of focus on, on culture here. It's interesting. Okay. Well, the domain expertise is not quite relevant, uh, you know, in this exercise. Um, it, it, it's, it is sort of yes or no, right? Like if somebody was looking for a product leader in enterprise software, you know, and highly technical, I would be a sucky candidate. You know, I wouldn't even be, you know, in the pool, if you will. Um, I, I have sometimes just thought about leaving the domain expertise out of this exercise, but it's kind of nice that I have seven of each. <laughs> okay, what else do you see? Strategy, uh, 56%. So uh, yeah, you're good at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd, love to test, I'd love to test that theory. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Uh, and I see the soft issues on culture. That's really interesting. Huh. Good. Okay. Uh, so keep calm and care, Gary. My point here is you don't have to grow all these skills overnight, okay? Uh, you actually can de develop them over time. So I just want to give you a sense of what um, product careers typically look like. And they start at the bottom here with building something, okay? And then you work up the ladder here. So I'm just going to share what my career looked like. The first something that I ever built was Sega Genesis, Sesame Street, Counting Cafe. Uh, which I'm confident no one used, okay? Uh, just so you know, like I, I worked on other stuff like Oregon Trail that I bet you some people have used. But in this case, it was the first time I, I built something. I got engineers and, and musicians and animators working together. And uh, I know, the reason I know that nobody used it is we only sold 300 units, okay? And we spent like $300,000. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge, you know, failure. But I learned how to build something. And then my first hit was called Sesame Street Elmo's Preschool. This is like 1997 or eight. It was the same year that Oprah Winfrey threw Tickle Me Elmo's out on the stage. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that this was the number one selling title of the year. But also I, I was learning about how to package a position idea. This is a full preschool curriculum for your child. And then over time, I, I, I could no longer build all the software myself. And I found myself building an organization, hiring product leaders that could build Arthur and Madeline and Schoolhouse Rock. And then over time, I realized that my job was actually building a company. So my first startup was called Creative Wonders um, and, and sold out to Mattel and Netflix and Check or some other startups that I've had a hand in building. And then my real aspiration in the long term was to build an industry. Um, so when I, when I went to Netflix, you know, the, the question I really wanted to understand was, were they interested in selling themselves? And, and they, they, said no, they, they weren't gonna sell themselves. And the reason that was important is they had a long-term idea of building out a new industry. And that new industry is streaming. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that most of you or almost all of you watched, you streamed something last night. And so that's the, the new industry that I, I, I had a help, hand in helping to build. So this is what product creator career looks like. And the cool thing is that at each of these stages, you're learning very specific skills. So at the build something, basic design and management, how to build stuff. At the hit, you start developing marketing and consumer insight skills to figure out what resonates with customers. And then when you're building an organization, it's all about leadership, strategy, about hiring, and then you begin to appreciate this idea of culture, that people can make great decisions without talking to each other. And then when you're a leader of a company, this is usually like what I call them muckety mucks, you're like a VP, a product kind of deal. Um, this is where you learn about cross-functional leadership. So when I first VP, became a VP, I would say stupid stuff like, oh, the CFO doesn't know what he's talking about, okay? And then I realized, no, my team was the head of marketing, finance, tech, et cetera, and my job was to help align them. And then uh, I learned a lot about company strategy. And then if you get the opportunity to build an industry, it's all about long-term strategy and partnerships. So think about what it took for Netflix to talk every device manufacturer in the world, anything with the screen, to, to, to enable you to watch anytime and anywhere. And that was all about long-term strategy and partnerships. You can't do it yourself. So this is what product leader careers look like. These are the skills mapped against the stages as you advance. So natural question, what stage are you 
do you feel you're currently at? And if you think you're sort of in between, you can say two, okay? Um, but I'm really curious to see where our audience today is in this career progression. And it typically is gonna look like stairs, Marcus, right? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm mainly curious where the, where the, you know, if the bottom stair is really the biggest or not. And I, I can see it's actually, you know, folks on the webinar are, are, are a little, and I'm pleased when I see somebody who's engaged in a build, building an industry, because you don't get that many shots at it. And it's really exciting when it happens. Any surprises for you, Marcus? 5% building an industry, the, yeah, it's kudos. Not, yeah, that's way cool. That's totally cool. Yeah, that'd be fun to learn about what industries. And, you know, it's probably not quite as rare as I make out to, but, you know, when you're engaged in that, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. It's exciting. All right, um, so this is what the career of builder looks like. And I can see that, you know, most folks are in the middle of it. Okay, which is neat. All right, so I'm moving on to my second chapter. So we've talked about sort of how do you package and position yourself and what are the skills and what are the skills that you develop over time as your career progresses. And now I'm gonna talk about, you know, why the heck I call it hacking. And this is experimenting with these different ideas. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Um, careers are not a linear path, okay? So I have been thrown off the train tracks. I have been fired. I've run out of money. I've been laid off, um, lots of stuff. And because of that, I've just been pretty open to trying new stuff. I also got really good at job hunting, okay? Um, and this is one of the reasons that my career has progressed because I was so comfortable with change and the ambiguity. Now, LinkedIn has all of our data, okay? They do. And, and they, they discovered the same thing. You know, if they were looking, what's the fastest path for a person to become CEO of a company? And it's not linear, it's not a straight staircase. It's a long and meandering path, back and forth. That person starts in customer support, and then they move into accounting, and then they move into sales, and then they move into marketing, and then they move into product, and then finally they're CEO. I mean, that's actually the, the, the person who's the next CEO at LinkedIn. That's what that person's career looks like, okay? They are meandering paths, full of experiments. Some work, some don't. And then actually the, 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 the moving in different functions helps you develop that cross-functional alignment. I love Google because when I did a Google search for fork in the road, this is what it delivered to me. But I bring up that phrase because this is the way I think about career hypotheses. These were my career hypotheses. These are my forks in the road. In, in the history of my career, I've, been, I've had to figure out the answer to these questions. Do I want to be in marketing or do I want to be in product? Do I want to start stuff from scratch or do I want to be a builder and, and scale stuff that exists? Do I want to be in consumer or do I want to be an enterprise? Do I want to work on entertainment software or do I want to work on education? And over the course of my career, these were my hypotheses. And through a series of experiments, I was able to answer the questions. So to know my career, my first job out of college, uh, we, we, we started a little sailing school. I grew up in Boston, but I moved to San Francisco and I love San Francisco. And so that was my first job but I was afraid of becoming a sailing bum, so I joined uh, an ad agency. So I worked in the mailroom. I delivered mail uh, at McCann Erickson, an ad agency. I wanted to be in a highly creative industry. And then I realized that I was in Silicon Valley. I wanted to get into technology. I needed to build a lot of other skills. I did grow up as a marketing person at the ad agency. And I looked for a, a place that had a ski area, okay? Which is uh, Dartmouth. I went to business school there at Tuck. And this is a picture of my wife. This is Kristen, I mean, we were boyfriend, girlfriend. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that those fashions come back someday. Um, and then during my second year of business school, I was building prototypes of kids' entertainment and education games using HyperCard. And maybe three people in the audience know what it is, but it was one of the first object-oriented programming languages. At two in the morning when I finished all my casework, my schoolwork, this is what I would do. And then my summer job, I went to IBM. I spent the whole time researching what companies would I like to work at when I finished business school. And the answer was I joined Electronic Arts, uh, which was, a, you know, it was an early startup and now it's got games all over the world. And then I wasn't, my wife is trying to cure cancer, so she holds me to a higher standard. She said, Gib, you're like rotting people's brains out with bang, bang, shoot them up games. 
you know, why don't you do something good for the world? And that's when I got engaged in building kids software. Uh, and this was all the software that I built with Creative Wonders. And then sold that company, Creative Wonders, to this is Kevin O'Leary. He's Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank. Uh, and that was the, called the learning company. And that's where I worked on Rita Rabbit and Oregon Trail. And then we sold that company to Mattel. Um, so, so, so that's what uh, it, it looked like. That was all good. Now, I want you to look carefully at my next startup. It was called familywonder.com. But look how pixelated the logo is. Okay? And that's just a sign that that company died. Okay? It was like, if you're looking for something fun to do or to buy, you go to Family Wonder. It was a failure. Okay? And here's my next startup. Okay? I was engaged in neuroperformance of helping folks with dyslexia uh, in, in improve their ability to read. And you can look carefully at the, at the design of this, and it doesn't take much to recognize that this did not work. Okay? And I just described like two or three years of failure in my career. And so I just want to acknowledge, and if you look carefully at my LinkedIn profile, you see, yes, I was a VP of product at Sega, and yes, I was a VP of product at Netflix, but in between, it says consulting, and that's just papering over a bunch of failure. And that's what real careers look like. There's experiments that work and there are experiments that fail, and most people just don't own up to it. And obviously, happy landing at dear Netflix. And this is where Chegg, we took this public in 2014, textbook rental in a homework help company. Uh, I know it's not known outside the States, but it was very exciting to take a company public. That's me on the left holding the hat. I refused to wear a suit. Um, and the reality is I wasn't very happy at that moment in time, and I'll explain why in a, in a couple of moments. But through that path, I was able to answer all these career hypotheses questions. I actually love being in product, not marketing, and I'm not a starter, I'm a builder. And then I love, love, love consumer, and actually I can do both entertainment and education. Turns out entertainment pays better, and education I feel like I'm doing better for the world. So I was able to answer these questions, and, and yes, I took on jobs, but often I would have coffee with folks or, or learn or go to school and different things to answer all these hypotheses over the course of my career. So the thing I want you thinking about right now are what are your career hypotheses? What are your forks in the road? And that's what I want you thinking about. And the way to answer the, the question is, what are your areas of interest or passion? Okay? And then another, that's like, you know, I was building hypercard things at two in the morning. What are your possible forks in the road? And career hypotheses is like, do I want to do this or do I want to do that? I have found that's the easiest construction. And what are the new potential roles that you seek? The things you've been dreaming about? Hmm, I'm an engineer. I want to go into product. Like, what does it take to do that? Or how could I begin to learn about that? Or what course could I take? Or I want to be a data scientist. These are the questions. These are the things that I want you thinking about as you frame your career hypotheses. And I'd like you to think long term. Because if you think out, you know, certainly five years or maybe five to 10, I just shared what, what happens if you think out 15 or 20. If you think long term, then you recognize that all things are possible. But we usually don't have time to think long term. And so that's what I'm encouraging you to do. So what I want you to think about right now is if we take this experimental approach to hacking your career, we need metrics, right? We got to figure out if this was a good thing to do or a bad thing to do. So the question I put to you right now is what's the right metric for evaluating career success? What are your possible metrics that would help you to understand if a person is having a successful or unsuccessful career? If you do these experiments and try stuff, what would be the right data to look at? Okay, so I get happiness, okay? I, I get uh, essentially, I, I think of it as job satisfaction. Uh, what, what else are you seeing, Marcus? Fulfillment to happiness, I mean, it's uh, within that realm. Um, seeing money, I'm seeing money. I see compensation. I'm seeing money. <laughs> see. What else? Free time. Free time. Good. Yeah. Life fit, uh, I'm fit with values so that you work for a company that's uh, connected to you somehow. Good, good, good. Uh, it, it, what kind of things would you connect with? Oh, I'm seeing lots of good stuff. That it's a product that you believe in or it's an industry there that you you're... Go. There you uh, go. That, that you right. know, my world, you know, is it's somehow doing good for the world, right? I mean, remember my wife saying I wasn't doing any good for the world, rotting people's brains out, binge, binge watching with Netflix or, 
or um, doing bang bang shoot 'em up games. By the way, my my wife's you know she's tough, right? Because she's curing cancer. She's got the 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 high road. Okay, I see lots of great ideas. So I see the job sat. I see the money. I see impact on the world. You know, and and so what I what I'm going to share with you is I I took these metrics and I'm going to graph them out uh, for my career. So here's what income looks like. And and the question is, you know, which of these metrics is helpful or not? So what you learn, J World at the very left, uh, you don't make much money in a sailing school. And then you can see business school, no money. And then I was going up and to the right with education uh, startups. And then that valley of death, that was the two or three years where I was just failing, failing, failing. And then you can see things were up and to the right with Netflix. And I left Netflix and up and to the right with Chag and I left Chag and it's up and to the right now. So that's just what money looks like, okay? Um, notice I didn't go into the penalty box for that three years off. I actually picked up where my income would have been. It's a linear graph from Family Wonder to Netflix, which is fascinating. I didn't get put in the penalty box for taking on that risk. So the other thing I did is satisfaction, okay? So here's the way I think about this, and I've been graphing this forever. Um, on a scale of zero to 10, where zero sucks and 10 is awesome, what is your current job satisfaction? Right. That's what I want you thinking about. Um, and by the way, you know, like in the last couple of weeks, I don't I'm guessing most people's satisfaction is down. You know, I, you sort of have to average it out over, you know, six month period. OK, um, you have bad days, what have you. So now I'll just share what mine is like a porpoise. OK, so just look at the jump over Netflix. So I I joined Netflix. I was super happy. You know, that's like eight, nines and tens. And then my satisfaction started to drop, and really for two reasons. First, I love learning stuff, and at some point, I'm kind of ready for the next challenge. That's usually about five years. But the second issue at Netflix was I'm great at finding a startup with proof of concept and helping to scale, but at some point, the company becomes, becomes so big that my skills aren't as relevant. I'm more of a generalist. So I took a statistics course in business school that you know, was good enough for, for my years at Netflix. But today, you know, to, to run product at Netflix, you'd have to have like a PhD in statistics, okay? So you can see it jumping and then check, you know, up and to the right and then it dropped. And really I was frustrated by the slow rate of change in the educational technology industry where things went really quickly from DVD by mail to streaming and Netflix, the transition from paper textbooks to e-textbooks still hasn't happened, which is why we had to invent the homework help. And you can tell I'm up and to the right in the, in the stuff that I do today. And then the last one, I let my wife do this for me. And she just evaluated whether I was doing good for the world. So look above family wonder, pretty high, okay? Um, because I was building educational software good for the world. And then Netflix, this is my wife being probably unfairly tough on me saying, hey, binge watching is rot rotting people's brains out, okay? So this is my wife's judgment. And then you can see when I went to Chegg, things bumped up and to the right because we're helping students to save a billion dollars renting textbooks instead of buying them. And then, you know, I'm very engaged as a teacher trying to help people to get better at their jobs and careers. So this is good for the world. So I'll tell you what I learned from this exercise. It's really the most helpful thing that I found is this notion of making sure that your job satisfaction at any moment in time, it wants to be eight, nine, and 10. Okay? It really, really wants to be. And if you find yourself persistently for six or 12 months at a five, it means you have some thinking to do. You have to form some new hypotheses, new experiments. And, and I have found that the proxy metric that I use for career hacking is really about just this one number, which leads me to a logical question. What is your current job satisfaction? So I've been asking this for a year. I have tons of data. Um, and I just want to know. It's funny, I'll, I'll have to, you know, I can probably get enough data to, to, to see what the real effect of COVID was on the job sat of everybody. All right, Marcus, well, how do you feel about what you're seeing? So the, the dissatisfied um, people are 39%. So uh, hopefully this talk um, gives you new energy, inspiration, and so on to, to take the next leap in your career. Uh, yeah. But we also have happy campers, so 27%, 9 or 10, so well done. If you look at it carefully, I've structured it in the form of an NPS. So NPS, you, 
calculation is take the nines or the tens, the people who are raving at 25%, and then subtract the zero to sixes, which is 40, okay? So that's a minus 15 uh, NPS. By the way, NPS is a very tough scale. Um, it's, so it's easy to be negative. Um, and actually minus 15 is pretty high, <laughs> okay? I'm used to seeing minus, I mean, for the audience that I have here. Anyways, so I agree with you. I'm delighted for the nines and tens. And then, you know, it always makes me a little sad that there's 40% in the zero to six. And they should be thinking about you know, do I want to change within my organization? Do, do I need a new boss? You know, is it time to go into a new skill area? I don't know. All right, so here's the question. This is, I want to get a little bit at, at the reasons why. What could be better about your job? And if you can, keep it simple at one word, and I, it's fine to add, you know, multiple answers because uh, we're building a word cloud here. So what, yeah, the boss. <laughs> I wish I had a better boss. I, I love the fact that this is totally anonymous. You know, honest to God, um, we, we can't see who's answering the questions. I'm assuming leadership means they think the leadership of the company is a little off. Is that your assumption, Marcus? Yeah. Look at that, skilled colleagues. Everybody likes working on hard problems with incredibly bright people, right? Yeah, and we uh, saw autonomy as well, so having the ability to focus on whatever you want right? ownership and autonomy they want to be learning a lot and and things that they're passionate about right um which is it's good it's good yeah i'm bummed about the big leadership um well listen w when you're the muckety muck the big boss be better than than your current leadership and, and boss uh so just take that on as a personal challenge all right, super helpful to me. Uh, career hacking, this is what I've learned. Uh, be bold. So, um, you know, look in the startup world, startups, you do the impossible. You know, think of yourself as a startup, be willing to take on some risk. And then think about your potential hypotheses and the experiments you want to engage in, in this process. I bring it up as the 2 a.m. test. That was me building kids prototype at two in the morning. But think about what you're really passionate about. And those are clues for career hacking. And there's lots of ways to learn about these different vectors or hypotheses. You know, often it's a side project on a Saturday or instead of watching Netflix, you do some reading or you take an online course. These are just, or you have a conversation with somebody that moved from engineering into product. These are ways that you can begin to learn. And at the end of the day, you know, I, there's been different theories on this. I believe that if you're really passionate about the work you do, that develops the intellectual curiosity, which gives you the tenacity, the grit, the persistence to do great things. And all companies are looking for that. Um, so these are the things that I've learned about the hacking. And then the question is what enables risk? Like, okay, give you say, take on more risk. How do I do that? Education, it, and it's changed. You know, I, I took two years off. I went to business school. You know, it was good for me, good social context, really focused. But today, it, there's a lot of ways that you can learn on the side. And then if you find small success, that gives you the, the, a bit of a confidence to go into a new area. I, I built kid prototypes on my own that gave me the confidence that I could go build kid games. Keep your life simple. So my wife and I bought a house in 1993. It was our starter house. It's still the same house. We haven't took an, taken on any more mortgages or anything else. And then it's super helpful to, to develop job and career hunting skills. Uh, so I, I wrote something on Medium called How to Find a Great Job, where I sort of articulate what those skills are. But it, it's nothing like taking on a new job, knowing that you could always find another, that enables risk, which is cool. All right, so now I'm in the third chapter. And um, I, in my hot, entire career, have had something that I call my personal board of directors. None of us are self-aware. Um, we're not. And so we need help and feedback from people that know us, that care about us, and have specific expertise in the areas that we're pursuing. So this is my current board of directors, okay? And in the last three to five years, I've had to beef up with people who are speakers and writers. Uh, Mark Randolph is, just wrote a book uh, about Netflix. He's the bottom left. Uh, Sarah Bernard's the top right. Um, she's one of my pals in something called the Product Leader Summit. 
this is what they look like today. They, they don't all know they're on my personal board of directors and I check in with them every three, six, nine, 12 months, depending on what's going on. But this is they, they're a collection of peers and mentors. And I started this idea because my, my first boss, this, you know, when I first was running product, his name was Greg Bestick. He's the middle white haired dude. He said, I asked him, hey, Greg, I need help getting better at product leadership. He said, sorry, I can't help you. I don't have the skills, but go out and build your community of peers. So he said, you know, if you find the heads of product at all these different companies, they're going through the same issues as you. That's a great way to learn. And that was sort of the beginning of this personal board of directors. I went to a tiny Amherst College. This is a mentor. This is Ron Hogue. He said, Give, go out and find a, good, find, find a good company and make it great. I had done a collection of startups. He said, I don't know if you are lucky or good, um, but why don't you look for a good company that can become great? And that was the genesis for me finding Netflix, which was actually quite a bit bigger than normal companies for me. You know, when I first showed up, there were like hundreds of engineers in the building. Um, and, and that was great insight from a mentor. And this is Irv Grossbeck. He also went to Amherst, you know, a generation ahead of me. Uh, he's, uh, he, he invented the cable TV industry, but he, he said, Hey, Gib, can I tell you something you may not like? And I like buckled my seatbelt and he said, you're too nice to be a startup CEO. And I had been debating, you know, I'd run product at a bunch of companies. Would I like to take the next step? And like, I know there are some nice CEOs, but when he said that to me, I realized I'm too thoughtful. I'm too disciplined to be a startup CEO. And it just released me. It saved me from experimenting for five years with banging my head against a wall being a startup CEO. Incredibly helpful. Patty McCord uh, ran HR for Netflix. I was trying to find non-traditional career and I couldn't find it. And Patty said, just tell people what you want. And so when product when headhunters called me, this is like four or five years ago, said, hey, I'll do it, but I'll only do it three days a week. And they said, yes, you know, just from a one comment that Patty made to me. And then this is my wife, Kristen. She's like, hey, Gib, for you, it's all about creative pursuit. And she nicely encouraged me to focus on what I do now, which is a creative challenge of talks, workshops, and writing in this space. You know, my wife knows me well, right? And incredibly helpful. So some tips on your board. Um, you gotta invest in the good times. So you can't just reach out when things are crap. So when you're feeling good about things, that's actually an even better time to reach out and build these relationships. When you have your collection of mentors, listen carefully. Like I, I remember all these things 10, 15 years from those folks. And then it's not the same board. You have to refresh often. Uh, first, people age out, they're no longer relevant. And second, there's new sets of challenges. Like I, I had to bring in three or four people that do online workshops and webinars, et cetera. And then check in with them on whatever basis so they know enough about what's going on and care enough about you to be helpful. Peers are, I'm gonna say it's easy, but because of LinkedIn, it's, it's easier than it was 20 years ago to find folks in a similar function, a similar stage and, and company as you. And most of the time, it just means keep up with your past colleagues. And that's where LinkedIn makes it really easy. And you're providing mutual support. So there's really no excuse for not finding the right peers in this board of directors. The harder part is finding the mentors. And the mentors have extraordinary judgment. They have broad skills and network. And they're this wonderful combination of being candid, like Irv Grosbeck was with me. Hey, can I tell you something you may not like? and caring, like at the end of the day, he cared enough about my career to de develop that candid feedback. So finding mentors, it's hard. So my first tip is do not ask somebody, hey, will you be my mentor? It, it, like, it's, a, it's an awkward conversation. Um, what you wanna do is have a, a weak link. So this is John Liu. I, I was the three day a week product leader at, at NerdWallet um, two years ago. And John was in data science, he wanted to go into product. You know, we're in the same company, that's the weak link. And he said, hey, can I go out to lunch with you, et cetera. And I actually liked him. There has to be some personality fit. And then I, I test people like, okay, set up a lunch in five weeks for us. And I just wanted to see if he would care five weeks from then. And these are little things I would do to see if it was worth my while to invest some time. And then look for ways that you can create value. So like me, the way people create value, I'll show you what John Lou did in a second. You know, I worry about being relevant, right? Like, so I spent a lot of time with 20 and 30 year olds trying to understand the world today. You know, okay, well, tell me what's going on with TikTok. Giving helpful feedback, uh, 
you know, giving feedback to, to written word, any of those things. John, you know, he wanted to go into product. Do you have a side project? And I got sort of frustrated with him. I said, finally, John, no, I got nothing for you, but I need you to build me a website. And, and he said, I can't do that. So I gave him my credit card and I pointed him to Squarespace. And on Monday morning, he had built, you know, I described this as my baby website, but it still exists today. So John found a way to create value for me. Okay? And that's how you create these relationships with mentors. So one of the easiest things you can do based on today's conversation is build that personal board of directors. And when I ask people, usually about 10 or 15% have one. Um, but it's probably the most helpful thing to help people navigate careers, especially in challenging times. Find that collection of two to four peers and two to four mentors. And within a year, you can have this caring board. Uh, and it's probably the most helpful thing that, that you could engage in doing tomorrow to, to accelerate your career. So I'm bringing it home now. So what I want you thinking about is, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And my suspicion is the folks in the zero to six category on job set are hanging back because they're, they're afraid of change or afraid of something, okay? So I just want you to think, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And I'd like you to find some ways to take action. To, to take some kind of change, because I want you to get to the eight, nine, and 10. And the way I want you to think about that action is think about how you position yourself via th those product and leadership skills in that career progression ladder. I, and then I'd love it if you form these hypotheses, and then you find ways to experiment via side projects. It could be take a class, have coffee with somebody, any number of small ways that you can do that. You always have a little extra time if you spend a little less time watching Netflix, okay? It's okay. And then build that board of directors and begin to have conversations about your questions and get feedback from your board of directors. Now, I get lots of questions from people I don't really know and understand, and it's just hard to answer. But if you have a set of people that care about you and know about you, that's when you get real meaningful insight. And that's what this personal board of directors is all about. Because at the end of the day, I want everybody here today to, 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 to get that job sat to eight or above. And it's really worth it. Okay? And so that's, this is the moment where I say thank you. Um, but if you know me well, I have one more thing, right? So thank you for being here today. But sometimes I feel like a street performer, like doing their thing. And street performers, they always do this incredibly stupid thing which is they pass the hat. And that's the moment that the crowd leaves, okay? And, and I, I've been that person to leave. And I'm doing it right now. I'm passing the hat, but not for money. I'm asking for your feedback. So I'd love, love, love it if you would hold up your phone using the camera. You don't have to click, um, but a link will magically pop up for a SurveyMonkey link. And it's an NPS score. So zero sucks, 10 is great. Pick any number you want. And then I'd love it if you told me one thing that was good about today's talk and one thing that could be better. And this is my 342nd uh, NPS survey result. This is how I've learned to, to write, do talks, workshops, online flavors of all of those things. Because your feedback's incredibly helpful. I've sometimes had ideas from one person that, that has launched like some of my most successful efforts. So I'm, art, I'm thanking you in advance. If you have an Android device where it, 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 you know, you're on Lollipop and it didn't quite work, um, you can go to www.gibsonbiddle.com, my, my baby website. I put a link for Chris, you'll see it right at the top, it says Chris people, click here. And I built you a teeny little page that's got the PDF of this talk. It's got the NPS survey. Uh, and then there's a couple other links, uh, hacking your career essay on Medium, just sitting there and waiting for you. Um, and then one thing Marcus and I are, are doing uh, on September 30th, I don't know if it will be in person or online, I do both, uh, but we're doing an all day product strategy workshop together. So we'll talk, uh, I, I was intrigued that like 58% of you said it was your superpower. Um, over the course of the days, I'll introduce you to six tools, frameworks and models and you'll build a product strategy for either your company or a company you know and love. And then Marcus has provided some discount codes for friends of Give, get 10% off, and many friends of Give if you, if you bring your, your team from your company. 
Um, so that's September 30th. And with that, I'm ready to answer questions. Uh, and thanks in advance, in advance for doing the uh, NPS stuff. Okay, Marcus, how you doing? Great, that was uh, really inspiring. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was me remembering Gibson. to stop sharing. Well done, Gibson, well done. Um, so a question from Marcus. In your experience, what has differentiated good PMs from exceptional PMs? Oh, 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 it's another Marcus. I thought it was for you. Uh, yeah, so Marcus with a K. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing is it's the superpowers thing. So most people think they need to be well-rounded. Um, and the great ones are maniacally focused on usually two of those skills. So let's see, a great product leader that worked for me, uh, Todd Yellen, uh, he ran personalization at Netflix. Now he's the VP of product at Netflix. Uh, and he, you know, he was great at the consumer science. So, and he had domain expertise. So I hired him because he had done his first movie. He had actually built a film. Um, so he really understood storytelling and movies. And then uh, the way he was supporting his family, because you can't do it with your first film, was he was coaching uh, parents of, well, uh, the kids of wealthy parents on how to do well on the entrance exam for college. So, and he, so he had the grasp of numbers. Um, so, you know, what was great, he was great on super, uh, he was great on the consumer science, great at the A-B testing, great at consumer insight, and then he, he could really deliver in the relevant area around movies and storytelling. One of the things he did in the last year, he did Bandersnatch, which is one of the first interactive stories um, with uh, Black Mirror. Anyways, so he was great. Um, you know, they tend to, to over, you know, they're sort of, I don't know, two X in certain areas. They're not generally well-rounded and their skills are an incredible fit and match for that company. So that's what I see. And he's got some other ones. He's a great fit culturally. He's candid, he's courageous, he's got intellectual curiosity. Those are the three values of Netflix that he maps well with. Anyways, my point is BU understands the needs of the company and, and you know, find those things you're passionate about. Okay, go. All right, we have a question from Anonymous. Um, how do you oh, progress God. from an entry level role in product to more senior positions? How do you progress from uh, junior to senior? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so that's where that, I find the career progression ladder really helpful. So the PDF's available, and I outline this in the Hacking Your Career essay on Medium as well. At the beginning, you're just learning how to build stuff. Okay, so I, my daughter is 22. Um, she started as a product manager at Rent the Runway. Uh, she's got consumer science and design skill, uh, an engineer. Um, anyways, at the beginning, you're just figuring out how to build stuff, like how to work with engineers and designers and the business partners. Um, so that's the, the build something stage. Um, and then I, frankly, I encourage people to be patient, right? Um, it takes a lot of time in figuring out how to learn this stuff. Um, but just find a project that you can ship uh, and you've, you know, you're introduced to the anxiety when you actually launch stuff. Is it good enough? Is it bad? You know, and then you learn about the consumer science, starting to talk, talk to customers to find out what could be better, those things. Anyway, so just relook at that career progression ladder and think about what skills on that list you, you need to develop now. Um, all right, I'm picking a question I'm personally interested in as well. So what is a good example of a light process that you mentioned in the presentation? Yeah, good. that's a great question. Um, so, so here's the thing. I always try to combine chaos and discipline, okay? So inventing stuff and innovation requires some degree of chaos. Like you don't know the answer, so you have to do lots of experimentation. For me, the discipline is product strategy, okay? So forming these theories and hypotheses, product strategies, having metrics that help measure whether you're succeeding or failing, and then mapping you know, how they, they fall out as projects or tactics. So this is the discipline of product strategy against the uncertainty in the chaos of innovation. So to answer the question, one of my ways that I bring discipline to the chaos is product strategy. 
And then an example, I wrote an essay about how to run a quarterly product strategy meeting. Um, that is a light process um, that helps people to share the results and learnings, to pass it on quickly, to, to, to enable people to make independent decisions without checking in with everybody. Um, so that's an example of, you know, quarterly product strategy is one of my light processes. Uh, and then culture is another great example uh, when people can make great decisions without talking to each other. You know, I've been focused on product strategy because everybody got way into the agile stuff. All good, you know, but that's how you build stuff with others. I've been trying to get more focused on the what you choose to build and, and the why. Uh, and, and that's why, I mean, I really focus on three things, product strategy, career hacking, and the third is culture. Um, and it's really because I think the world's got this agile stuff and how you work together down. There's enough people talking about this stuff already. Amen. I agree. Uh, another question that uh, is interesting oh, from. Sorry. <laughs> what was that? I'm sure I just pissed off somebody. I no, 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 no worries. Um, so a question from Anonymous. I love building and launching new products, exclamation point. Uh, how can I use that in my career as a strength instead of jumping to new companies every year and a half? Uh, I get Ooh. bored, dot, dot. And uh, I, that resonates with me. I have a similar kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand because I, you know, I, I, I do something new every four to five years. Uh, here's the thing, which is if you take a long term perspective, imagine it's 20 years from now. Um, you know, so you love building stuff, right? So the, the thing is, you want to build something that's enduring, okay? And you want to have real pride and ownership. So I would just nicely encouraging, encourage you to think a little bit more broadly about what it means to build and launch stuff. So yeah, you can build and launch product, but think about what it is to build and launch people and their careers. Think about all the learning and helping to build successful organizations, to, 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 to help build successful companies, or maybe even build a, a new industry. You can't do that if you're jumping ship every one or two years, okay? So I would just stop for a moment and think, okay, what's my career gonna look like in the rear view mirror 20 years from now? You know, what, what is the work that I'm doing that I'm gonna be proud of? Uh, and that's just take a longer term perspective. And I'm hoping to get your passion for building stuff and launching stuff, think about it a little bit more broadly building and launching careers of other people, building and launching organizations, companies, even industry. That's my hope for you. All right, another one from uh, Anonymous. Uh, tips from shifting from full-time product VP to contractor, but that could be any type of product uh, role, right? Uh, to contractor, uh, any tips there? Yeah, so from full-time to more flexible contractor, yeah. So I've done that. Um, you know, one of my career hypotheses was, did I want to be full-time or part-time? I, I, I realized that I put a lot of premium on flexibility. So I, 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 won't, work, I won't work for anybody full-time. Uh, I, I call it direct deposit. Um, what are the tips? You have to be super clear about what your skills are and what skills that you bring. So in the case of my three day a week jobs, it was sort of crazy. I, I was the three day a week product leader at Nerd Wallet, at Life360 and Metro Mile. These are all three startups that are all doing well. Um, nobody thought it could be done. You know, at the end of the day, what I was bringing in the three days a week was a, a lot of focus on recruiting and helping to build a great team, a lot of focus on company and product strategy. So I was marketing my superpowers, essentially. Um, cause for someone to take on the risk of taking on you as a part timer, there's, there's real, they got to get a lot of value out of that to, to give you the trade off of flexibility. Um, and just note, I, I don't do consulting, um, drives me crazy. Um, anyways, and then you think of yourself as a startup or of one, you can only do three things. So I do talks, workshops, and writing. It took me a while to settle on those three things. Um, so just think of it yourself as a startup and the, the biggest problem with all startups is they fail to focus. Um, so, you know, I, I just gave my advice. Okay, Gib, you can only do three things. What are they? And the answer was talk, workshops, and writing. And it's worked out nicely for me. 
All right, there were a few other questions relating to uh, moving from, uh, let's say, technology to product and data science to product and things like that. Any, any things to keep in mind there as you, uh, as you want to pitch that idea or move in that direction? What I notice is people in technology that want to go into product and people in data science that want to go into product, for some odd reason, are worried or strangely unconfident about their skills. I look at it as like an awesome path. Um, you know, I was the marketing person. It took me a while to develop relationships and to build trust with engineers. If you come out of engineering or data science, you know, you're, almost by personality, you're, you're way into the data and the numbers, okay? And you can build the respect and trust. So you know, my first thing is, you know, why are you worried, <laughs> right? Like, like, those are the two hardest skills to build in a product leader, and you have them, right? So I think it's generally the fear of unknown. So the main thing is spend some time understanding what the job really is. Um, and so my pals that have made the change, they, they were nervous about design, like what should stuff look and feel like? They were nervous about like discovery process of talking with customers. They were nervous about these issues of packaging and positioning. Just spend some time getting to know what that stuff really is, because it's probably not as scary as you think, okay? So set up coffee, read books, watch videos, and, and begin to demystify all that stuff. Um, because you have the most critical, important skills in your technical knowledge and your data knowledge. Like, you know, go for it. I mean, it's, I mean, I was a freaky English major. I, I, I just got lucky, right? Um, and, and the way I built credibility with tech partners was all through strategy and, and leadership and, you know, getting maniacal focus on the two to three things that really matter for a company and a product. Anyways, you, you already have your source of trust, which is awesome. We got a new question. Um, this one might be difficult, but uh, let's see. Uh, tips for building a hard to copy product. Oh, well, that's easy. Okay, there's only, I mean, if you simplify it, there's only four things that are hard to copy. So think for a moment about what makes Netflix hard to copy. If I gave you 500 million bucks to start a startup to compete with Netflix, what would be hard about that? And there really are four things. So, so you can think about what they are, but um, the first is unique technology. So Netflix has unique personalization technology. It knows the member taste for 178 million people in the world. It's amazing, okay? Um, that's unique technology. There are other examples. I mean, the, the, the multiple flavors of encryption and encodes for different devices, lots of cool stuff. But that's unique technology. The second is a network effect. So Netflix created a network effect. Every device in the world is magically set up to stream Netflix. It took us many years to do that, but we did, okay? And there's actually a new network effect. Imagine if every artist and storyteller in the world only wanted to tell their stories on the Netflix platform. That's a new network effect. Uh, third would be economies of scale. So Netflix, because it's got 178 million members, they can spend $20 billion on content this year, where poor Amazon can only spend $5 billion, or Hulu's at $3 billion, and Disney's, Disney's probably at five now. Um, but that's this huge advantage in an economy of scale. And then the last is brand. Um, so Netflix has built a trusted brand. You, you know, are comfortable with the fact that every month they're pinging your credit card for 15 bucks. And you're also comfortable to try new stuff from them. Like my guess is 10% of you watch Bandersnatch just because you trusted Netflix. And that brand gives them liberty to try new experiments, which is way cool. So four things, uh, brand, economy of scale, network effect, and unique technology. And I wrote an essay called How to Define Your Product Strategy. It's 12 steps, 12 essays. It only takes about an hour to read. I think it's worthwhile reading. And of course, they could come to the Product Strategy Workshop on September 30th and learn all about this, because I think it's way cool. <laughs> there were a couple of questions relating to book recommendations. Um, anything that you're reading right now that you could recommend or uh, past books that have formed your? Yeah, sure. I mean, first I write more than I read. Um, so, uh, okay, but the books, 
um, yeah, Seven Powers by Hamilton Helmer. He actually outlines what he believes are the seven hard to copy things. I actually believe they're eight, um, so he and I argue, but it's called the Seven Powers. He's, a, it's weird, he's an economics professor at Stanford, but every one of his chapters has three quarters of easy reading and then one chapter of economic theory. You can just, you can skip the economic theory, but the book is great. Um, Peter Thiel's From Zero to One, uh, I've reread multiple times. Um, you know, one of his famous quotes is competitions for losers, which, which I agree with. Like people tend to focus too much on what their competitors are doing and not on, you know, delighting their customers in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways that over time lets you just, you know, be in your own world, which is really what Netflix has done. Uh, Stratechery is just, you know, what, what's his name? You know, I, I read that when it comes out. Uh, that's, that, that'll keep you going for a little while. I mean, the Bible at Netflix was called The Innovator's Dilemma. Um, I don't know how relevant it is today, but it was incredibly helpful to me in thinking about long-term strategy. Um, a question relating to the technical skills that we talked about earlier. So do you need to be a programmer to product lead a technical product? My first instinct is no, but you know, it depends a little bit on what you mean by technical product, right? Um, you know, I'm biased, right? So I was the English major, like when I joined, I was actually interviewing in Netflix and I had been rejected by Yahoo because I wasn't strong enough technically. And there I was at Netflix, I had been talking to them in the, like five weeks. I finally said, hey, I want you to understand that I'm going to be the one English major in a building with 100 engineers. And they said, no, that's okay. We're looking for something different, right? Um, so it worked out for me there. There's no way Google would ever hire me, right? Like, I, I just, they would say I don't have the technical chops. Um, anyways, oh, crap, Marcus, I lost the thread. Can you repeat the question? Oh, uh, do you have to be a technical, do you have to have technical skills to work on a technical product? Uh, the thing I didn't understand is what do you mean by technical product? Um, so like, obviously I've focused most of my career on consumer. Like one of my superpowers is the consumer insight is around the qualitative. That gives me the skills. Um, could I run product for uh, a data mining product? My guess is no. Uh, but my real problem is I wouldn't be passionate about it. So I probably wouldn't find myself doing that. Um, so if you're passionate about it, I would encourage you to chase it, even if you're a little nervous that your technical skills aren't strong enough. That's, that's a good answer. I'll stand by that, damn it. <laughs> so uh, another question from Marcus. Uh, in retrospect, what are a few career moments that were particularly risky and required you to make difficult trade-offs? Yeah, I mean, the, the perfect hindsight of my whole career was I, looking back, I wish I had taken on more risk, okay? Um, like I stayed too long in some jobs and I should have jumped ship earlier, probably due to loyalty. Um, so that's my overriding theme. That's why I really encourage people to take on more risk than they might naturally. Uh, hard decisions. I mean, my stupid... Like I didn't do enough due diligence for the neuro performance startup that with for dyslexia. Um, I think I was too eager to go back to work. Um, so I, you know, that was a mistake and not, I mean, I have CFOs on my board of directors and CFOs are great at helping to evaluate startups because they're investing money and I'm investing time. I think in that case, I just, I wasn't diligent enough in assessing the startup. Uh, what other, you know, the more interesting stuff are the failures. Um, you know, I felt really good about Chag. I was looking specifically for an educational technology company that would go public. And, you know, four years later we went public. So, but I, I, I guess because of my failure and discipline, you know, of really tire kicking a startup where I would be investing my time, you know, three, four, five years, I was just better that time around. So I'm just reflecting on my stupid mistakes. So make fewer stupid mistakes. Great, I think that's, um, 
uh, those are the questions. We have a few more, but, or we got one. Well, let's take um, one more. It feels like that time to me, Marcus. Okay, we just got one from Andreas. Thank you, Andreas. What do you dislike about consulting? I think you mentioned this. Uh, what's your view on? <laughs> what do I dislike? So I was a marketing and design consulting firm. You have to do bids. This is all the work we're gonna do. You have to win the bid and then you do it. Um, and then you have lots of insight and you hope that the company will execute well and they may or may not. So, you know, at the end of the day, I just favor being at the company and doing the work myself, right? Um, to, to make the good stuff happen. Um, so that's, that's the really short answer. Um, and that's why I don't consult. It drives me crazy. <laughs> and the other thing is focus, focus, focus. So, you know, think about, you know, what disciplines required to only do three things, talks, workshops, and writing. And that means saying no to lots of board stuff and advisor roles and whatever. Uh, I just don't have time for it. Because uh, if you want to get great at stuff, you can only do two or three things. Okay, um, should we close her up? Let's do it. So uh, thank you very much for participating in this really interesting webinar on uh, hacking your product leader career. And uh, just for everyone in the audience who are still here, uh, just a big thank you, uh, Gibson. Um, it was really You're insightful. I loved it. Uh, if you didn't get the memo, www.gibsonbiddle.com. I left a link at the top of the page with a bunch of links that I hope will be helpful to you. If you haven't done the NPS, I'd love your feedback. Um, but a lot of questions that came up, you can find you know, my essays about them on Medium. Uh, and this is great fun. I'm obviously trying to be much more worldly. Um, and it's been fun working with you, Marcus. So thanks so much. And I, I look forward to seeing you in whatever context on September 30th, because that will be yeah. great fun.